Hi, this is Omar Abdelgawad, and I'm going to speak about bone infection or what's known as osteomyelitis in children. So what are objectives of this lecture? We first would like to describe the pathology of osteomyelitis, and then we would like to describe what are the pathogens that cause osteomyelitis and explain the clinical presentation of this disease. Also, we'd like to treat the treatment of osteomyelitis, and a very important, we'd like to compare between acute and chronic osteomyelitis in pathology, clinical presentation, and treatment. A good source that you can use to read more about this topic is Pediatric Orthopedic, a handbook for primary care physician. Uh, this book is written by myself and Dr. Naga. So let's start with acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. This is the most common form of hemat uh, osteomyelitis in children. Uh, what is the definition of this condition? It's an acute infection uh, of the bone and the bone marrow. So acute hematogenous osteomyelitis is an acute infection of the bone and more marrow. It's more common in boys between the age of four to six years. Let's discuss now the pathology of acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. It happens in, in the metaphysis. First, what is the metaphysis? Metaphysis is the area of the bone which is uh, close to the um, physis. So this is the growth plate or the physis. This is the epiphysis and this is the metaphysis. Metaphysis is the area of the bone which is adjacent to the physis. And why it affects the metaphysis? It affects the metaphysis mainly because of its sluggish blood flow. So the blood goes um, uh, here from the afferent arterioles, becomes very sluggish and slow here, and then it comes back uh, with the venous sinusoids. That's why it mainly affects the metaphysis. Uh, so what exactly happens? So bacteria from distant focus, like uh, infection in a skin or a teeth or a nose, comes through the blood, and then because of the sl slow and sluggish blood flow here in the metaphysis, it settles here and forms the infection. That's why we call this type of hem osteomyelitis hematogenous osteomyelitis, because it spreads um, uh, by bacteria from a distant focus, so it spreads with the, from the blood. And the bacteria from distant focus comes and settles here because of the sluggish blood supply in this area. So what's happened after the bacteria settled in, in the metaphysis? So the bacteria will come from a distant focus, as we said, settle in, in the metaphysis here, form a focus of infection. It will be surrounded by inflammatory cells, and then it will end having a metaphysial abscess here in this area. So this is the pathology of the osteomyelitis. As we said, its bacteria comes from a distant focus, settle into the metaphysis by its uh, slow blood supply and sluggish uh, circulation, and then it will form a focus of infection. Uh, inflammatory cells will come, and then it will end having metaphysial abscess. After we had discussed the pathology of osteomyelitis, let's speak about the microbiology. So Staph aureus, this is the most common pathogen in all age group. And be aware of the strains of the Staph aureus, which are um, methicillin resistance. So M MRSA um, is uh, a common cause of osteomyelitis um, in children in, in all age groups. Uh, certain other bacteria also are common uh, in certain population like group B streptococcus and E. coli. They are um, uh, common causes of osteomyelitis in the neonate causing neonatal osteomyelitis. So if you have a kid, you're suspecting neonatal osteomyelitis, group B streptococcus or E. coli are common pathogens. Also salmonella is a common pathogen in cases of children with sickle cell anemia. And strep pneumonia is a common cause of osteomyelitis in children less than 24 months of age. Recently, uh, there is an organism called Kingella kingi, and it has been found to be a common cause of musculoskeletal infection, both arthritis and osteomyelitis. The problem is identification of Kingella kingi needs uh, certain uh, uh, cultures. Uh, however, now after the use of um, uh, PCR, polymerase chain reaction, um, identification of this organism is um, more common and there has been some studies that shows Kingilla kingi uh, may be actually one of the uh, commonest organisms to cause uh, osteomyelitis and arthritis. What about the clinical presentation of osteomyelitis? So first the child will present with the general size of infection which is fever, vomiting, uh, ill-looking, toxemia, chills and also you can find the local manifestations of the infection uh, on the affected bone so you'll see redness, hotness, tenderness and swelling. This is uh, more easily detected with bones which are uh, subcutaneous uh, like the proximal tibia or the distal fibula. Uh, and if osteomyelitis affects bones of the lower extremity, this would be accompanied with inability to wear bait on the affected side. 
So in cases of osteomyelitis, you will find elevated markers of infection. Uh, however, this may take few days to show up. So you'll find elevated white blood cell count, elevated SID rate, and elevated C-reactive protein. Let's speak now about the imaging studies for patients with osteomyelitis. The first thing that you have to get is a radiograph, plain x-ray. This is very important, so you start with the x-rays because it's very helpful to exclude other causes um, of pain and swelling like fractures or tumors. Uh, keep in mind that the x-rays will be negative for the first 10 to 14 days of um, the disease process. So if you have a patient with osteomyelitis um, that the condition started only four or five days ago, when you get the x-ray, the x-ray may be completely negative. After 10 to 14 days, you will start seeing pre reaction. As you can see in this case, uh, this is um, a, a toddler with a, um, upper tibial redness uh, and swelling uh, for more than 10 days. And if you look closely here, you can see the pre reaction here and the pre reaction here. So this is uh, the boundary of the bone here. And if you look very closely, you'll see the pre reactions uh, where the tip of the arrow is. Um, so after 10 to 14 days, you can start seeing pre reaction as an indication of an infection. Uh, in case of chronic osteomyelitis, as we're going to see later, there are uh, specific um, changes that happens in the x-rays, and we are going to discuss that later in the lecture. Uh, bone scan, this is um, a very useful uh, imaging tool uh, to detect infection. Uh, and we order the triphasic bone scan. This is uh, the, the bone scan that we order if you're suspecting an osteomyelitis. And, and basically, the triphasic bone scan, uh, it uh, measures uh, the blood flow to your bone uh, in three different um, uh, time periods. Uh, and in cases of infection, you will, it will appear as a hot spot uh, of the infection site. If you can uh, see, this is uh, a chill, a child with a, a suspected infection bone scan was taken and if you compare the right to the left side uh, it's obvious he has an increased uptake or what we call hot spot in the upper right tibia uh, indicating osteomyelitis Let's speak now about MRI. MRI used for, to diagnose osteomyelitis has been increasing recently, uh, and to a large degree, it has replaced the use of the triphasic bone scan. So the MRI is very sensitive to diagnose osteomyelitis, um, and how it will show in osteomyelitis, uh, it will show as um, uh, increased um, the signal on T2-weighted images, uh, and there will be enhancement uh, of the medulla of the affected side. Uh, so if you see, this is an MRI of a child who presented uh, with lower leg pain um, and uh, inability to put weight, the MRI show uh, very clearly that this child uh, has an increased um, signal in the T2-weighted images in the lower tibia, uh, which is uh, very uh, consistent with having an osteomyelitis. Um, what is the advantage of the MRI? Uh, MRI has uh, some advantages in case of osteomyelitis. First, it's become very positive. It becomes positive very early in the disease process, so you don't have to wait for 10 to 14 days, as in plain radiographs. And also, it can show the subperiosteal abscess. Uh, the subperiosteal abscess is when the uh, exudate um, uh, collects underneath the periosteum, uh, and we uh, this uh, and as we're going to see later on, this is an indication for surgical intervention. Uh, so you can see this uh, in the MRI. MRI. Another advantage of the MRI, it can show if there is an affection of the nearby joint uh, indicating um, uh, possible combined osteomyelitis and septic arthritis. Uh, this happens sometimes in the hip joint uh, in which the upper uh, part of the femur is in uh, the capsule and cases of osteomyelitis can spread to the joint causing uh, septic arthritis. So MRI now is becoming uh, the um, standard of uh, diagnosis uh, for cases of uh, osteomyelitis. It's very sensitive. Uh, it can show the area of affection very clearly. It becomes positive um, uh, very early in the disease process. It can show the subperiosteal abscess and it can show combined cases of osteomyelitis and septic arthritis. So what are the conditions that can present similar to osteomyelitis? Uh, we have Ewing sarcoma, sometimes present similar to osteomyelitis. The kid will present with pain and swelling of the affected extremity. He will have elevated markers of infection, so he can have elevated ESR or C-reactive protein. However, radiographs will help you differentiate between osteomyelitis and um, Ewing sarcoma. In case of Ewing sarcoma, you will find uh, uh, bone destruction, um, elevated uh, uh, periosteal and new periosteal bone formation. And remember that uh, Ewing sarcoma 
stomach affects mainly the, the depths of the bone rather than the metaphysis in cases of uh, osteomyelitis. Septic arthritis also sometimes presents very similar to um, uh, osteomyelitis. Sometimes the differentiation between septic arthritis and osteomyelitis is very hard. However, if you examine the child closely, you'll find that most of the pain is related to the joint and the joint movement. So if you try, for example, to move the knee and the child has, osteo uh, has uh, septic arthritis, any passive movement of the knee will cause severe pain to the child. You will find that the child um, is really uh, preventing any movement of the affected extremity. Uh, MRI will help you to differentiate between um, septic arthritis and osteomyelitis. However, keep in mind that uh, septic arthritis and osteomyelitis sometimes happen simultaneously together, especially in the hip and the shoulder, uh, in which there is communication between the proximal femur and the hip and the proximal humerus and the shoulder joint. After we had discussed the diagnosis of osteomyelitis, let's speak now about treatment of osteomyelitis. The fact that I'd like to stress here is osteomyelitis is a medical condition. So osteomyelitis is a, basically a medical condition that in certain circumstances, um, it needs some surgical intervention. However, it remains a medical condition that can be totally treated with antibiotic. This is a very important fact uh, that I'd like to stress. Any osteomyelitis is a medical condition. It can be treated with antibiotic alone. However, there are some certain indications for surgical intervention that we're going to uh, see later on. So you have to give that antibiotic in the appropriate um, dose and for the appropriate period of time. And this antibiotic, of course, has to be the correct antibiotic for the offending organism. That's why obtaining culture is very important for the treatment of osteomyelitis. And you have to obtain cultures from the affected side. And you can do that or you can refer the patient to the intervention radiologist. And then you introduce a 16-gauge needle and aspirate from the bone marrow so that you can get some um, uh, specimen for the cultures and be able to know the offending organism. After we knew that antibiotics is the main treatment of osteomyelitis, let's discuss now um, the different aspects of the antibiotic. So the antibiotic in general has to be the organism-sensitive antibiotic for a total of six weeks. So this is the general rule. It's uh, the organism-sensitive antibiotic for a total of about six weeks. Uh, how do we know the organism? Uh, this is by culture, as we said before, uh, the blood cultures or cultures uh, from the affected um, uh, area. Uh, if you don't have positive cultures, you can depend on the knowledge of the most prevalent bacteria in the patient's age group and in the patient's geographic area uh, which he comes from. Uh, uh, usually we give two weeks of parenteral antibiotic followed by four weeks of oral antibiotic. This is the general rule. Uh, however, this um, uh, changes uh, according to the um, organisms and if there is a available uh, organism-sensitive antibiotic oral or not. So if you have a good oral antibiotic that is sensitive to this uh, bacteria, you can go less with the parenteral antibiotic and go longer with the oral uh, antibiotic. If you don't have any good oral antibiotic that's going to um, be against that specific bacteria, you can go the whole period with parenteral antibiotic. In this case, um, uh, uh, you have to get a peripheral line or what's called pick line so that the patient can have the antibiotics through that pick line. Uh, what is the antibiotic that we start? Uh, we start usually with IV clindamycin or uh, another broad spectrum antibiotic till we have the results of the cultures and the sensitivity. Uh, if you live in an area that is more prevalent with methicillin resistant staph aureus, you can start with vancomycin until uh, you get uh, the cultures. And you always have to monitor the response of the patient clinically. Uh, if you give the antibiotic, the patient should within 36 hours have a marked improvement. Uh, also, uh, the C, uh, C-active protein will uh, show improvement. The values will become less. ESR uh, will take a longer time to come to normal. Sometimes it, weeks, it takes weeks. So yeah, we don't depend on the ESR usually. We depend on uh, clinically fever and pain um, and uh, on the C-active protein to monitor the response of the patient to the treatment. After we spoke about the antibiotic treatment for osteomyelitis, which as we said is the main uh, treatment for osteomyelitis, let's speak about the indications for surgical interference. What are the reasons uh, that will make you call the orthopedic surgeon to come uh, to do surgery for these kids? There are three main indications for um, uh, surgical intervention in case of osteomyelitis, which is the development of subperiosteal abscess, as we have mentioned in the MRI. Uh, so if you get an MRI for this patient and there is collection underneath the periosteum, this collection 
infection has to be drained. Um, the second indication, if there is no response to the medical treatment after 36 hours, so you give the antibiotic uh, parenteral uh, in the beginning and there is no response after 36 hours, the patient still have fever and pain. This is an indication for surgical intervention. Also, if there is an extension of a nearby joint, so a proximal femur osteomyelitis extended to the hip and that became a septic arthritis, of course, now you have to open because septic arthritis is a surgical condition. So there are three main indications for surgical intervention intervention in case of osteomyelitis. Um, sub, um, the, number one is subperiosteal abscess. Number two is no response to medical treatment after 36 hours. And number three is extension to nearby joint. So again, very important. Please remember that osteomyelitis is a medical disease, so it can be treated um, completely by antibiotic. There are certain indications that will make you uh, uh, refer this patient to an orthopedic surgeon or ask for an urgent orthopedic consult. Um, and these are the subperiosteal abscess, no response to medical treatment after 36 hours or extension to nearby joint. After we had discussed acute hematogenous osteomyelitis, which is the most common form of osteomyelitis in children, let's speak about the non-hematogenous osteomyelitis. So what are the causes of the non-hematogenous osteomyelitis in children? It can be post-traumatic osteomyelitis, so it can happen after open fracture. Uh, there is a fracture with a connection between the fracture and the external environment that can get infected and can cause osteomyelitis. Penetrating trauma, also if they reach to the bone, can cause osteomyelitis. Puncture wounds, if they are deep enough, they can cause osteomyelitis. Post-surgical, which means after an orthopedic surgery, patient develop infection which extends to the bone that can cause also osteomyelitis. Human and animal bites, if they are deep enough, they can cause osteomyelitis. Decubitus ulcers in children uh, who are not ambulating, it can uh, extend to their sacrum and cause osteomyelitis. And it can be also local spread of infection, for example, ingrowing toenail can cause osteomyelitis of the uh, phalanges of the toes. These are all causes for non-hematogenous osteomyelitis. The management of non-hematogenous osteomyelitis uh, is basically antibiotic, which is similar to the hematogenous osteomyelitis. However, uh, most cases of non-hematogenous osteomyelitis will require orthopedic consultation, uh, as most of them will require surgical debridement. After we have discussed acute osteomyelitis, let's speak about chronic osteomyelitis. So what is chronic osteomyelitis? Chronic osteomyelitis is an osteomyelitis with chronic changes of the affected bone. So if the acute osteomyelitis was not completely cleared and the chronic changes happens in the bone, we call this chronic osteomyelitis. Uh, what is the pathology in case of chronic osteomyelitis? There is two main things in chronic osteomyelitis, sequestrum and involucrum. Sequestrum is when uh, there is a dead piece of the bone that becomes separated from all the surrounding tissues. This um, piece of the bone will become more dense in the x-ray. So if you see this piece here and this piece here, uh, this is a sequestrum. Uh, it's part of the bone that becomes separated from all the surrounding tissues by the infection and these parts became dead. Uh, this is these pieces um, here. You can can see them after excision uh, of this uh, sequestrum uh, surgically. Involucrum. Involucrum is a periosteal newborn formation. So if you see in this picture, you see all this is a periosteal newborn formation. All this is a periosteal newborn formation. Uh, and this is a reparative process uh, of the bone to try to strengthen the bone structure. So chronic osteomyelitis, it is um, uh, osteomyelitis with chronic changes. So if acute osteomyelitis is not cleared completely, it will lead to chronic osteomyelitis of the bone. Uh, the two main pathology um, uh, uh, to uh, know are th is the sequestrum and the involucrum. The sequestrum is a dead piece of bone. In most cases, it appears in the x-ray as more dense structure, as you can see in this part and this part. And involucrum is the preosteal new bone formation, as you can see here. It's a reparative process that uh, the bone is trying to strengthen the bone structure. This is another x-ray of a six-year-old girl with chronic osteomyelitis. If you can see here the involucrum, uh, this all this is a preosteal new bone formation uh, uh, that is a sign of chronic osteomyelitis. Management of chronic osteomyelitis required orthopedic consultation. So if you remember when we discussed before, we said acute osteomyelitis um, is a medical condition. However, chronic osteomyelitis cannot be cured medically. So uh, this has to be referred to an orthopedic surgeon. And if there is sequestrum, this sequestrum has to be removed surgically as we saw before, um, because um, otherwise there would be recurrent infection from this septic focus. Uh, antibiotic treatment in general, you don't need um, antibiotic for chronic 
chronic osteomyelitis, uh, except if there is an acute exacerbation of infection. So if you see a patient presenting with a, a new onset of local pain, swelling, uh, or fever uh, on top of a chronic osteomyelitis, you can give an antibiotic therapy or after surgical interference to clear the infection. Thank you very much.